From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 127, recorded on February 14th, 2017. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twip. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Yellow, and joining me on a sunny yet frigid cold day here in New York City are my two colleagues in parasitism. Dixon de Pommier and Daniel Griffin. Hello, Vincent. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and and, and Daniel's, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel's back in vivo. Daniel back in vivo. Yes, in situ. I'm, I'm physically, but you know, I, I I was just saying, I was listening to the last podcast mm-hmm. on the way in, and the sound quality was as if I was here. We the magic of, we um, of modern electronics. I think yeah. the magic of Vincent's electronic mastery. Oh, you know, of, this, this, and this and big, B&H. This tower of power here. <laughs> tower of power. I, I wonder if people that. appreciate how much work that you put into this, Vincent, That's for okay. the as long as they quality. As long as they listen. That's what matters. Exactly. Call me anything you want. Just, Just call listen. me. <laughs> and you could support us if you'd like, and that would help us do more. Microbe.tv slash contribute. It would. I want to tell everyone, I'm in a giving mood today. Nice. Okay. Do you know this book by Shel Silverstein, The Giving Tree? Did you ever read it? I do. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. Well, I'm in a giving mood today. I'm not giving a tree. I'm going to give away a book. Nice. And you have to stay tuned to find out how to get it. It's going to be free. I mean, I'm going to tell you until, well, who knows when? Could be any time randomly through this episode. (laughs) So just have to listen to every word Daniel and Dixon (laughs) You know, both of us just moved a little closer to the edge of our chairs. (laughs) Well, I was trying to figure out, am I eligible? That looks like a very nice book. (laughs) You want it? I can just give it to you right now. (laughs) And to hell with the contest. (laughs) Well, anyway, yeah, we should give it away. If you want another one, I can tell you where to buy it. It is a good book. But I think you gentlemen have written something uh, similar, although maybe not as much detail as this one. We'll talk about that later. Daniel, tell us about our last case. Yes, for everyone tuning in or retuning in, uh, this was a Peace Corps volunteer in Fiji. It was a fever case, 24-year-old male, reporting several days of fever, headache, dry cough, rash, Feeling poorly, starts off with diarrhea, um, but reports no blood, mucus, no vomiting, but there is some abdominal discomfort. The heart rate is over 100. Uh, Initially, he is seen at a nearby private hospital for evaluation. Um, We're told that he has no prior medical uh, problems or surgeries. Uh, Social history, he's a man sexually active with other men, um, not always protected. He he does drink, apparently a significant amount of alcohol. Um, his home, we understood, had recently been blown away by a cyclone. Um, <clears throat> his Apparently, his drink of choice is alcohol, is beer. Um, but then also, he's a fan of kava, which maybe some people will talk about. Um, he His diet is um, not what we would usually recommend, m- mostly white rice, um, bread, not a lot of vegetables. <laughs> Um, there is uh, a history of some unfiltered water. He is a, he's admitted to the hospital, continues to feel poorly, continues to have fevers, but now he starts to have localization um, where he's having pain in the right upper quadrant of his abdomen. Um, on exam, he is noted to have a tender, uh, palpable liver. His white count is elevated at 17.8. He is eosinophilic, clearing of his eosinophils. Um, his AST, ALT, these are um, called transaminases or liver enzymes. They're slightly above normal. He has a number of tests done. Dengue, chikungunya, lepto, um, all blood cultures, all negative. He undergoes an ultrasound of his liver, which reveals an 8 by 8 sonometer um, mixed echogenic lesion in the right lobe of the liver. And we also understand that he's HIV negative. Hmm. 
Dixon, please take t- uh, the first one there. I would be honored to do so. Wink writes, Dear TWIP professors, I think the young Peace Corps worker in Fiji has amoebiasis. <clears throat> he might have acquired it sexually or by ingestion. He might be diagnosed by um, EIA or PCR. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying EIA, yeah, I'm trying to remember what that the EIA stood for. Enzyme immunoassay. That's right, that's right. Uh, that's right, yeah, ELISA, I would say ELISA. And, and should uh, initially uh, receive metronidazole. Eight centimeters is fairly large, and aspiration should at least be considered. Uh, by the way, thanks for answering my question on disseminated strongylodiasis. If you don't mind, I have one more part to that question. Would the filariform larvae in someone with auto-infectious cycle be immediately infectious if they found their way into the stool, into the soil, or through the soil by by a stool deposit? I am wondering if this uh, was a um, reproductive advantage to the worm before coffins and embalming. <laughs> Perhaps the super infection syndrome has evolved because of that advantage. Uh, wink from Atlanta. Hmm. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think, Dixon? Well, I have several um, responses to his email, so we, why don't we save them until the uh, diagnosis is finished because we don't have that many to go through. But uh, I, I think in answer to the just this one part for strongyloides, I think if you were to become um, exposed to the feces of this individual, they would have infectious larvae and you could become infected that way, yes. Okay. I think you should take the next one, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so I get the next one because it's from Dan. Is yeah, that what Dan it is? to Dan. <clears throat> Again, Dan writes, Dear Twipsters, I think that the Peace Corps volunteer in Fiji with fever, headache, diarrhea, and right upper quadrant pain has an amoebic liver abscess. Differential diagnosis would include arboviral infection, biliary sepsis, pyogenic abscess, mm. leptospirosis, or acute viral hepatitis. The findings of tender hepatomegaly, raised WBCs, eosinopenia, a modest rise in liver enzymes, and the scan appearance are all consistent with hepatic amoebiasis. Diaphragmatic irritation can cause a cough. Positive serology for e histiolytica would support the diagnosis. Cysts may be found in the stool. We, we notice that Dixon is nodding his head back left and right, shaking his head. We'll, we'll get back to that. Treatment is with metronidazole or tinidazole followed by a luminal amoebicide to kill any intestinal cysts and prevent transmission. Aspiration of abscess fluid can confirm the diagnosis, but isn't always necessary. Although he's been drinking unfiltered water, he may have acquired this parasitic um, infection sexually, um, this parasite sexually. MSMs are a high-risk group. Apparently, kava has an aphrodisiac disinhibitory effect. Mm. The reference to kava confused me at first, I thought he was drinking the Spanish sparkling wine, spelled C A V A versus the K A V A. Right. Stay parasitic, Dan. <laughs> you are very parasitic, aren't you? I am a through and through card carrying parasitologist. That's absolutely. But you're right. a parasite. I didn't say parasitologist. Oh uh, no, I didn't mean. Uh, no, I wasn't born in Paris. I was born in New Orleans. So right? we only have two guesses. Just two. Hey, listeners, what happened? Come on. You know, there's some of you who have who have disappeared. Elise, I'm talking to you. You used to write all the time. Yeah, you don't like us anymore? Isn't that sad? <laughs> no, I don't think that, Daniel? that's not what that means. I yeah. They're just they had busy lives just like we do. I take it poisonally. I was actually, I was specifically thinking about that on the on the train and the way in, you know, now that I'm commuting mm. again. Uh, yeah, well, of. I'll tell you what, gentlemen. If this trend continues for the next few weeks, we'll just can it. I think, you know, I think, you know, you got to be responsive. I would say we need to I be guess, responsive. I guess you have to go with the flow, yeah. whatever they say. So maybe, we, maybe we're falling out of favor. Uh, so I, I want to discuss <laughs> Wink's answer to the first part of that question mm-hmm. because he said that you should um, aspirate, uh, mm-hmm. um, should be considered. And I would say that if you did, you would find a lot of dead liver tissue basically with nothing else in it. Because the organisms are not found in the dead tissue. They're found at the living edge. So a biopsy would be much more appropriate. However, in your differential, you forgot to consider the fact that this could be a conococcus hydatid cyst. Yeah, so yeah. if that's true, but the x-ray doesn't show that, I mean, the, the MRI would not. You could distinguish these two conditions by an MRI nowadays. But in the old days, when you just had mm-hmm. x-rays to go by, 
Uh, you would never, never, never consider um, biopsying a, a liver cyst right. from hydatid because you could spread it that way. So and We had a case once where you talked about that, Daniel, right? They were about to biopsy the young lady. This was the liver. scroll. Was this the scroll down case? Scroll or the, down. We the yes. One. We yes. One. And uh, you said it was a good thing they didn't go in. That's right. Yeah. Because it would have been a tragedy. And that's how they learned, I'm presuming, in the beginning. So now we have serologies to distinguish these two entities from each other in lots of other ways, too. Um, the other uh, diagnosis um, needs to be addressed, too, because I think that if you were looking for cysts in stool of a patient that had just an amoebic abscess, mm -hmm. you wouldn't find them. Mm. Uh, the organisms are not in the gut tract any longer. They're now in the liver. So uh, that is a, the reason why it probably his diarrhea didn't advance onto um, dysentery because the organisms invaded the t tissues rather than stayed put. Yeah. And that this is a strange specific uh, deal primarily because if you go around the world, you can find some hot spots for liver abscess and some other hot spots for dysentery. And these are strain differences between the two amoebae. Whether or not it's due to a, an mm -hmm. endobiont, as they're now called, these double-stranded <laughs> RNA viruses, we don't know because that hasn't been looked for as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe Daniel would like to add to that. <clears throat> well, I think, uh, actually, at uh, Dixon, I think you do a good job of bringing this together here. Um, you know, the nice thing I like about this case, it starts off as a fever. It starts off right. nonspecific. And you really, you really don't know. People say, oh, let's generate differential. I'm like, differential. It could be anything. <laughs> Especially in um, Fiji. <laughs> yeah. And then when it starts to localize to the liver, you're like, okay, right. now, now I've got a clue. Because otherwise it's this undifferentiated right. fever. Right. So now it, it localizes to the liver. And more so, it localizes as a, 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 le a lesion, mm -hmm. not just an inflammation. So it's not a hepatitis. It's actually a lesion in the liver. Right. And so then we start putting together, well, what are, what are the... The, the main differential, I would say, is between an amoebic abscess and a pyogenic or a bacterial abscess. But yeah. I think we also want to think about um, echinococcus. But it's not going to give us fever, right? No. You know, so that and that's, it won't hurt either. Yeah, and, it, and it's gonna. It's more of the things you know. You don't don't play uh, soccer and get kicked in the liver or something. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, but no, th this is you know the fever, the lesion, the whole story we get really gives yeah, yeah. us this different. And then comes the question of how do you approach this. Right, so right. echinococcus off the table, I think, pretty much. Um, is it safe to go in? It, it's relatively safe because you're not going to spill these. Um, mm -hmm. These basically, they're they're stem cells in the echinococcus cyst. Right. That that oh. a single cell is going to form cysts everywhere. Right. Um, so it is interesting. You can do a serology test. You can check and see. And by the mm -hmm. time you develop an amoebic cyst, you're going to see positive serology. That's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Ninety yeah. plus percent of the time. Yep. So that's a fairly sensitive um in a local population it could be tough right because so many people will be positive like well, what does it really add mm -hmm. right I, mm -hmm. we had a case um in india where it was like so we can do serology it'll be positive we already know right <laughs> so um so sometimes diagnostically they will put a small catheter they'll guide it by ultrasound or cat scan and sort of we say resource rich areas and they'll drain it out mm -hmm. um and what you can do, you're not necessarily going to find the amoeba in there, right? This is all dead. Um, mm. They say anchovy paste, but um, <laughs> but most of the time, it's actually a There yellow. goes an entire yeah. listener's <laughs> worth of Caesar, Caesar salad fans. <laughs> but in all honesty, it tends to be a, um, a sort of a yellowish mm -hmm. um, uh, liquid that comes out. Um, I'm not sure they, where the anchovy paste got in the books, but you do see that a percentage of the time, and I, it's, yeah. it's memorable. I, I guess that's what it is, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it offends the people who want to eat salad. But what you can do is you can do an antigen test because right. you will mm -hmm. find antigen that's on those. Right. So that that is one way of confirming. But a lot of times, you'll actually you can get both. You can get they start off with an amoebic abscess. But then, you know, there's someone who has a propensity, and you're worried, and often you'll cover them with antibiotics. Sometimes they'll grow, mm -hmm. um, you know, bacteria out of, out of these drained lesions. Um, so in this case, um, the person went ahead and uh, had serology for amoebiasis checked, and normal is up to 80, and it was, it was slightly elevated at 2,560. <laughs> so, it was, uh, so it was strongly positive. Right. Um, they actually underwent transcutaneous drainage, um, mm -hmm. And then they were treated. Um, they were treated actually with metronidazole to yep. target amoebiasis, yep. um, but they also were given augmentin as well. Um, and the patient, um, the patient recovered, did well. Um, what are we missing? What's the last thing? I think you mentioned something. It was a, and we'll get back to our our listeners here. Is 
uh, there was a suggestion that, oh, we should check stool for O and P. Right. And um, stool O and P, when you have amoebiasis in the liver, um, will almost always be negative. But that has to do with the sensitivity of the test. We still think there may be a few cysts left in the lumen. Mm -hmm. um, so we recommend an uh, intraluminal agent as well to basically resolve that. Right. Doug Dixon, how would he have gotten this? Well, that's another interesting question. It has to be, it doesn't have to be, but it's usually orally ingested from contaminated, uh, fecal contaminated uh, items like water or food. But in the case of human feces contaminated, yeah, that's right. But in the case of a of a um, a gay male, uh, there was an old syndrome called GIRL, I believe, G R I L, uh, gay related uh, irritable bowel or something of that sort that mm -hmm. they uh, pinned amoebiasis on. You can actually um, through the practice of fellatio uh, and anal sex, you can transfer the cysts from one person to another. Uh, and, and that was thought to be the, the way in which the uh, the gay community transferred this infection from person to person. But but uh, this guy was eating and drinking all kinds of things and uh, drinking unfiltered water and that sort of thing. So I think he was rather careless in terms of his personal hygiene and as a result uh, just acquired this from the environment. May That's I, my guess. So may I, let me ask you. So uh, you ingest it. Yeah. And then you're, oh, okay. you, when do you shed... It's a quadranucleate cyst, so each of those nuclei can evolve into a single mm -hmm. trophozoite once it gets into the small intestine. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't stay in the small intestine because it's actually a large intestinal infection. Okay. So as it as it exists and the four amoebae emerge, mm -hmm. they travel down into the large intestine, establish the infection in the columnar cells, they burrow through into the serosa, and then that's how they get into the bloodstream. Um, mm -hmm. it, and, and if it's a quick deal, if it's a strain that has a propensity for forming cysts in the liver, then you're not going to have much of an intestinal um, syndrome. So as a result, he did come in with diarrhea, but that may have, he may have just acquired this a week ago, two weeks ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, because that's a pretty big cyst that he's got there, right? Yeah, that would be, a, that would sort of give you a timing of a little longer, because it, it can take a while for these things to develop and progress. Right. Now, tragically, these cysts that are present in the liver can rupture and go through into the pleural space. And there have been cases of that, and there has also been rupture and gone into the pericardial space, and those are even more tragic because it's an, almost a death sentence. Uh, I don't know, have you uh, encountered any of that um, sequelae? I've always had good outcomes. <laughs> good, oh, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky, you know, because you do hear, I mean, there's, there's cerebral amoebiasis, yeah, there's right. a lot of, a lot of um, potentially bad outcomes here. I've always been exactly. fortunate. The, the only, I will say, bad outcome I think we presented at one point is I had a patient, and this was out in Colorado, so no one was even thinking of it. It was, uh, a, yeah. it was not my patient, it was someone else, um, but then I got involved. But they, were, they had a colonoscopy, they saw say, an apple core lesion, they went for resection, and then the pathology came back. Hey, oops! It's um, an amoeboma, oops. which um, is you know, an amoebic mm. tumor oh, right. growth in the. Now that's in the a colon. long term. Now, product. fortunately, fortunately, it wasn't terrible, right? I mean, they took it out. The right, person right. was fine. They recovered. Right. It was right. uneventful. But they went in thinking, "Oh my gosh, I've got cancer!" You know, yeah, with all the staging course, and the lymph nodes. Um, so, in a sense, they were glad you don't have cancer. Exactly. You had this infection, and now you're all good. Yep. You know, you didn't need the surgery. <laughs> but, exactly. But, you know, they, they wouldn't have known. It was, you know. When Harold Brown was uh, ruling the roost here at Columbia and, and lecturing to the medical students, uh, and I was his uh, assistant and then graduate student, I recall hearing one of his stories when he was traveling, I believe it was in the Philippines, where a person actually had acquired and maintained a chronic um, amoebic infection that evolved into an amoeboma. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they acquired strongyloides. Now, they were not immunosuppressed, but what the amoeboma did was it slowed down the gut transit time for fecal uh, exit uh, because it, mm -hmm. it, it's an obstructive uh, protrusion into the lumen, right? And this person developed auto-infectious strongyloidiasis and ended up dying from it. And when on autopsy, they, they saw this uh, large amoeboma, which is induced by the amoebae. So and it's an eosinophilic. By the way, it's a, it it attracts all of the eosinophils to that particular area. So they they wouldn't be eosinopenic because 
They just redirected them from the bloodstream to a specific target where they then encountered all of these virulent factors from the amoeba, which destroys the eosinophils, and you're left with all this deposit of these horrible enzymes that, of course, are good in some circumstances from the eosinophils. But in this case, it's, uh, it's, it's not a great thing to have. Yeah. So when you ingest the original, what is it called? The cyst. It's a cyst. Yeah. It has four nuclei, you said? Yes, that's correct. And so that is the source of additional cysts in the stool? That is, well, the, the amoebae eventually, when they reproduce and produce their lesions yeah. and start to feed on the tissues, some of them differentiate into those cysts. In the that's, gut. That's, that's okay. when that happens. And some of them, and then some of them go to the liver. Okay. Well, they don't always go to the liver. Mostly they don't go to the liver. This is a... This is a rare finding, basically. Most amoebiasis cases are restricted to the small the ones we, large intestine. The, one we, the ones we talk about on TWIP involve liver lesions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, of course. so far. So far. <laughs> so, so far. The other thing I wanted to say was that in the old days when they couldn't distinguish between an, a bacterial abscess and an amoebic abscess, mm. and they gave metronidazole, they cured them. It didn't matter whether there were some bacteria or from the amoeba because they both are anaerobic organisms and metronidazole, of course, uh, attacks all anaerobes, not just uh, mm. protozoans. So, so his uh, cyst was drained? Cyst was drained. And he, he was, was treated. treated. He was treated not only with flagell but also with augmentum, sort of mm-hmm. a broader spectrum antibiotic, which, which makes sense, right? I mean, this is a guy who's febrile. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's clear to see it. He's got pretty serious stuff going on. And you know, you know, it isn't always. Remember Occam? Remember Occam? Yeah. Like when we were living in the 1600s, that That's guy right. with the. He's a good friend. Um, of my <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> you know, there was this. You have one thing, and that's it. Um, but you know, pa- patients don't read his stuff anymore. It's all out of date, right? <laughs> this so is true. They often have two things, and it's often prudent. I think we talked about malaria. Is you may have yeah. malaria and a bacterial that's right. infection. That's right. You may have amoebiasis, and um, you know. So uh, I think in this case that was prudent and led to a good outcome. You know, that's um, and how did brilliant. how did he get it? You know, we, you know, there was a, a patient I was seeing last week, and and he had this really bad infection on his leg, and, mm-hmm. and he may have acquired it in a in a certain setting. Um, and you know, he and he was asking me, he's you know, is this my fault? You know, <laughs> you know, I jokingly said yes, but <laughs> you know, I actually, but uh, you know, it's, none of these things are really people's faults. I mean, you know, you can acquire this. He could have gone somewhere and had some food and. And, you know, a lot of people will be cyst carriers without symptoms mm. um, right. and they'll prepare food. You know, maybe they don't wash their hands quite as well because he got this from somebody. He wasn't the yeah, person yeah, who yeah. brought it That's to right. Fiji probably. Right. And then, um, you know, it's in the food and he gets it. And, you know, so it's not always, you know, I should say, not always somebody's fault. It's just these things happen. In certain areas of the world, there's a, there's a fair amount of this and a person can be exposed to it. Right. Um, I brought up the kava. And I, mm-hmm. we, we didn't have a lot of takers who got excited about <laughs> one kava. Fifty uh, percent of her respondents got excited about. Yes, kava. that's true. So, so half of the people wrote back were very excited about the mention of kava. Right. right. And uh, the, the interesting thing about kava, and when I first got this case, it actually said no history of kava drinking, and I was like, let's huh. let's address that again because that's curious. <laughs> but there were some case reports um, of a number of kava drinkers with hepatic amoebiasis. Right, and so the idea is this kava has some sort of hepatotoxic effect. Mm. The reality was, when you really looked at it, um, it was sort of picked out. I think that they drank kava in an area where there was a lot of amoebiasis. It wasn't even clear that there was more amoebiasis in kava drinkers than non-kava drinkers. Um, but there was sort of maybe stuck. I was thinking somebody may have read that literature but, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> or not <laughs> and uh, right. that, but there was that whole idea that hey the kava might have some hepatotoxicity it might make you i don't think it actually does um yeah. kava is it an aphrodisiac i don't know if it's really an aphrodisiac but it is sort of a calming relaxing it supposedly has this um effect i have my um, middle child drink it before bed to try to calm her down <laughs> so she'll go to sleep i do i was gonna okay. i was gonna bring some okay. kava tea in for you guys it's over where the do counter. you where it's, put it to uh, sleep <laughs> it, it's like a sleepy time tea you can buy it have. anywhere um you know there's actually a kava bar in in new york city is you can right? go to down in the village i think it is, is. <laughs> you know and you get drinks and you have your kava it's just sort of like a real you know you have a cup of coffee it gives you a little more energy have your kava it gives you a little less energy i guess <laughs> Boy, there is a very long Wikipedia entry on kava. <laughs> Huge. I mean, it's pages and pages. Do they have the active ingredients list? Yeah, they have a picture of uh, one of the, the active ingredient here. It's di, 
Uh, dihydro chicken wire. <laughs> dihydro chicken wire, right. Cavalactones. Yeah. Ah. This is the active ingredient. Interesting. Uh, 18 different caval- cavalactones have been identified, at least 15 of which are active. Wow. Things like cavane, dihydro cavane, methysticin, dihydromethysticin, yangonin. Uh, they're responsible for 96% of the plant's pharmacological activity. Be darned. Yeah, it's quite an extensive. Uh, I show them drying it here in Fiji on the roof. <laughs> There's also dermopathy associated with kava. Right. But nothing about uh, aphrodisiac. That must be a little, you know, uh, it's what do they call, uh, you know, side like, effect. A legend that comes up, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, but urban you know, myth. But, urban I would, myth urban. Yeah, but I would say, you know, he may have been going to these gatherings and someone may have prepared it who mm-hmm. happened to be a cyst carrier, you know, oh, who good. who knows? Good. You know, because um, you're not going to get this out of one of those bottle of beers that the guy, you know, the <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. bias is not going to be in the bottle so do you of beer. Like, do you like kava? I actually, I like the kava tea. Is it a good, is it a good taste? <laughs> you don't want to, it, it has an interesting taste. You don't want to add, you know, a lot of teas you'll add honey to, and honey, mm-hmm. it doesn't do well with honey. It has a slight bitterness. It's it's a nice taste. Yep. And, you know, and you can get it over the counter, and it's a relaxing evening, you know, beverage before going to bed. Uh, I'll have to try it. Yeah. We have to go to the... I'll remember to bring some in. We should all go to the... the we should ca- go to the, the Kava, kava Cafe. So there's no caveats <laughs> with the Kava drink. Yeah, we yeah, should no, re- re- record in. our next twip at the Kava Cafe. <laughs> yeah. Your kids like it? Uh, they do, actually. Sleepy time. I remember that. I used to like sleepy time tea. <laughs> yeah. So a little picture of the sleeping bear on the tin. Mm-hmm. I always used to look at that and get sleepy, yeah. yeah celestial <laughs> seasons, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Chamomile, all those, Yeah. <laughs> New age, new age uh, things. All right. Anything else, Daniel? Before we move on. No, I think that's I it. think that's it. Thank All you right. to our people, our emailers that wrote in. They're helping us because I'm going to be discussing this case in the future. So. All right. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. Dixon's already a chef, so he doesn't need this, right? They deliver seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients that you need to make delicious home-cooked meals they have. They come with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card, beautiful card, and pre-portioned ingredients, and you can make the meal in less than 40 minutes. They give you everything except salt, pepper, and oil. If you spend a lot eating out or at high-end grocery chains, you know who we're talking about, you can now spend under $10 per person for healthy home-cooked meals. Really a good deal. And uh, they set very high-quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers. Seafood is sourced under standards developed with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Seafood Watch, beef, chicken, and pork come from responsibly raised animals. Produce is from farms that practice regenerative farming, and they, they ship you only what you need. There's no waste, and the good thing is you can't overeat. <laughs> Unless you make 10 recipes at once and then eat them all, I guess. But when we would make uh, for two people, you just have enough to eat, and it's really good. You can customize your recipes every week. You get meat or non-meat. You can get a delivery option that fits your needs. You know, there's no weekly commitment. You get them when you want, and they deliver to 99% of the continental U.S. You can choose from a whole lot of different recipes, and uh, they're not repeated within a year, so you don't get bored. Right up now, if you go to their website, you'll see cashew chicken stir-fry with tango mandarins and jasmine rice. No kava here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Roasted pork with apple, walnut, and farro salad. Crispy baramundi. I just love that name, baramundi. You do. That's a fish, right? It is a fish. With quinoa and roasted carrot salad. Is it a farmed fish? Probably. It never used to be, but it is now. Yes. Fresh or salt water? It's both. In fact, it's huh. an, an andromous fish. Anandromous. Anandromous. That means it lives in both salt That's correct. and uh, that, fresh waters. That's correct. I, I used to call that brackish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. <it's, laughs> this is a longer discussion for another time, all right, I think. All right. <laughs> well, check out this week's menu. Get three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping. Go to blueapron.com slash twip. That's blueapron.com slash twip. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And I have to say, I tried this. It's really good. I like to eat. I'm not particularly fond of cooking. I hate getting everything together. That's it. You know, 
is my wife gives me everything, says, <laughs> cut this into quarter inch cubes, do this. I love preparing and putting it into bowls so she can just go boom, boom, just like Emeril does. You know, he gets all this stuff and wham, sure, wham. Of course. That's how to cook. I like doing the preparation, but I hate going to find, you know, this and that. And this, it's all in this box. It's great. In these cute little containers. Ah, you'll love it. You know, if you're busy and you have a lot of time to cook, try it out. If you don't like it, that's okay, but you should just try it. I've noticed a lot of people in the community where I live, Port Washington, are now and recently have signed up for Blue Apron. And I think maybe it's because they're listening to our <laughs> podcast. Uh, they, well, they know I don't you're know right. any other reason for that. Well, they have a local celebrity there. You, you know? should tell them to write in more, though. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're too busy enjoying this wonderful food. They, That's true. That's maybe. True. Maybe. You know, well, speaking of anchovies, we just had a little food commercial there. Right? <laughs> That's right. We have a paper for you today. Indeed. It comes from MBio, just published. It's called The Gut Microbiome of the Vector Lutzomia longipalpis is essential for survival of Leishmania infantum. And Dixon says we should have done this on TWIM. Well, as you will see. But uh, who's he to say, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I thought we would do it on TWIP because, it, you know, Dixon will, will love talking about the life cycle here well, like, and you explaining know, things to us. We all will enjoy this organism because it's it's complicated. Uh, the first author is Patrick Kelly and the last author is Mary Wilson. They're from the University of Iowa and they have collaborators at uh, National Institutes of Health and Baylor College of Medicine. And um, this is about looking at, at the microbiome of the sandfly host of Leishmania. Right. And so that's why Dixon thought twin because of the microbiome. But, that's exactly right. Um, I, I look at it as a, at a crossover. You know, we have to do these crossover. Yeah. When we did, what did we do about the, yeah, the last time we did the double-stranded RNA virus vaccine. We did. To uh, prevent, what was the It was disease? also leishmaniasis. It was, leishmaniasis. It was the mucocutaneous um, form yeah. of leishmaniasis. That's right. Oh, look, we have an arc here, leish, leish, <sighs> leishmania arc. An arc. Yeah. <laughs> Leishmania is forcing us into all these different disciplines, That's microbiology. Right. So we had a triple hit. We could have had a triple hit here if we had done twiv, twim, and twip. All right, Dixon, metacyclogenesis. Metacyclogenesis. Okay, so this is the process under which the organism goes after being ingested by the sandfly. And what does it ingest? It ingests the amasticote stage of mm -hmm. Leishmania. In, with a blood meal, right? Which is with a blood meal, but... They have to acquire that. Well, depending on the kind of um, uh, Leishmania species, in this case, they're using Infantum, but this is all laboratory based. So, if you were to think about this out outside in the real world, you've got cutaneous, you've got mucocutaneous, and you've got visceral Leishmaniasis. Mm -hmm. And sandflies transmit all of those. So, right. they pick up the organism either from uh, the blood supply or from the capillaries around the ulcer that develops when the ulcer forms in the skin. Because that's uh, the only place that the organism is found at that point. In cutaneous leishmaniasis, mm -hmm. that's the only yeah. place you're it's not find the blood. it. It's not blood. Got it. Um, from mucocutaneous, it's it's similar to the cutaneous variety. So, so what you're dealing with here is leishmania and phantom, which is a lookalike organism for leishmania donovani, mm -hmm. which okay. is the so visceral. It's a, it's a lab strain. They use. It's a lab. Well, it's a lab species. It's more adaptable to laboratory. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this one would be transmitted by blood meal. So, therefore, mm. this org, this um, this publication, or the, the investigations, I should say, investigate. What are the conditions under which all of these developmental stages can develop inside the gut tract of this little sandfly? Does it require externalities like uh, blood? Externalities. Or, <laughs> that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> you know, sucrose. I mean, the, the, the normal food for the organism is, uh, is sucrose from mm. plant material. That's what it ordinarily feeds on, just like mosquitoes. It uses blood to produce eggs, obviously. Uh, kind of like mosquitoes, huh? A little bit like mosquitoes. Mm. Not quite, but uh, but you could you could allow that as a stretch. The organism... <laughs> I then, was thinking it was a good connection you got there, but I was on board with that. <laughs> the organism, though, well, the difference is that we, we're not sure whether there are sexual stages to this organism that takes place inside the gut tract of the sandfly, whereas we're sure that they do take place in, this, in the, mm. the gut tract of the mosquito. So... That's a that's an interesting point actually because we're mm -hmm. we're focusing here on the transformation to the infective yeah, to that's human right, that's right as opposed to you know there's a this 
well-defined sexual coming together exactly. of the two gametes in the mosquito for malaria. So. And not only the, the, there's another difference too, and that is that the organism once the sexual stages do unite in the gut tract of the mosquito, they actually penetrate into the wall of the stomach, and that's where the sporozoites are produced. Mm -hmm. And the sporozoites don't go back into the gut tract. They go out into the hemocele of the mosquito, and they eventually find their way to the salivary glands where they're they're injected by the mosquito when it takes another blood meal. In this case, Mm. they stay entirely within the gut tract of the sandfly. Got it. You see, this is why it's on TWIP, because we wouldn't be able to have this conversation well, on true. TWIP, because you wouldn't be there, and nobody knows about <laughs> you parasites. Invite me. <laughs> well, no, no it's, you... interesting. it's interesting, too, because the question, you know, people would say, oh, I wonder if this applies to mosquitoes. Now, right. yeah. here, the whole development to infective cycle is occurring in the gut, in That's an brilliant. area yeah. where the, the context, the niche is yeah. critical. And not just in the gut. It, it Each stage of of the development leading towards the the uh, the stage for the promastigotes that, that actually get into the host, the mammalian host, each stage takes place in a different portion of the gut tract. Mm-hmm. And it's dependent upon the interaction between, uh, like a viral receptor and its uh, cell ligand, the, the, you've got these uh, molecular interactions that define in the gut tract where you can locate depending on the stage that you are. And there are four different stages what are to this they? organism. What are they? <laughs> well, I wish I had my notes with me right now because I'm not an expert on the developmental cycle inside of the okay. bees. But, but we, they do say uh, within the gut, the parasites taken up with a blood meal must escape the peritrophic matrix. Correct. And attach to the mid-gut yeah, that's right. epithelium. Yeah, that's right. They replicate and develop through several gut adherence forms as they progress towards the anterior end of the gut. That's right. Eventually, they develop to a non-dividing, not inherent and infectious metacyclic stage, which I guess comes out. It does. Oh, how does it get into the person? No, well, then it goes back through. It, it, it actually dissolves mm. the peritrophic membrane to get into the anterior end of the, of the sand fly, uh-huh. and it, it's injected during the taking of a blood meal. And in fact, there are lots it of factors. It goes back to the, sal- to the, it, to the proboscis of the, really? the, the sand fly. And the, the secretions from the salivary glands of the sand fly have a modulatory effect on the immune system. And they favor the uptake of these promastigote stages by the macrophages. So this this is an organism which actually attacks and successfully reproduces inside of your second line of defense, the the phagocytes of your body. They're unable to resist this infection. Okay. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, you ask about the cycle. We, We always sort of neglect, you know, the cycle outside of us we focus I know, you know, that's right that's and you look at you know we i'll say we with malaria we we didn't quite neglect it as much you know we have a whole special little thing on what's going on in the mosquito but you know when you come to in our textbook when we present you know we have you know a picture of a little fly and there's just a circle and we say cycle and fly yeah. <laughs> but then we, gotta, well, we're but then we go into at, detail about that's how that's it right. actually you know yeah, yeah. is so a, injected in sure. and replicates in the in the macrophage that's right, that's that you know right. And then it has to produce enzymes which, which allow it to go through the peritrophic membrane. Again, there's a slender form and a stumpy form, and, a, and they have different names, and we can supply those <laughs> names for you yes. upon demand. <laughs> Let's just go with the stumpy. And the- <laughs> Let's go with the stumpy, that's right. But the, the, un, the end result is that the promastigote stage is the stage that's right. infectious for uh, humans. All right, so the, the basis of this paper is this is happening in the gut. We know there's a gut microbiome we bacteria, so they're asking what happens – um, when they when the flies feed on different things and when they get infected, exactly. can we can we tell anything? So they have this uh, Leishmania infantum, which by the way came from a dog spleen in Brazil. Yes, they say in this paper that uh, pet dogs are reservoirs they in Brazil. Are. They are. That's they a are. that's a pity, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, and they're a reservoir for El Donovani as well. And this has been maintained in the lab by serial passage in hamsters. Right, mm-hmm. the sand flies. Uh, were reared at the Laboratory of Malaria and Vector Research at NIH. Right. And they are maintained in paper containers. <laughs> yes. On a 12-hour dark light cycle. And mastigos are from hamster spleens, um, and they maintain these flies on sucrose, and then they divide them into groups. They get, one gets sucrose, one gets blood, and one gets infected, L. infantum infected rabbit blood. Right. Uh, and then they dissect out the guts. Now here they don't take the whole fly because they just want to look at the, the bacteria in the exactly. gut at different times after infection. And then they uh, 
they uh, extract nucleic acid DNA from the gut, and they do ribosomal RNA sequencing. Right. So there's a you can make primers to specifically sequence ribosomal RNA, and that can tell you what kind of bacteria are there. You don't have to sequence the whole genome. And this study could not be done with viruses because you can't do the. There's no ribosomal RNA in viruses with nope. which to do this with. <laughs> so they did uh, several hundred uh, samples doing this. Yeah. And what did they find? Well, mm-hmm. if you uh, let me get back to that figure. If you feed flies sh- uh, sucrose blood or infected blood, uh, first of all. Operational taxonomic unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good term. I like that one. OTU <laughs> is basically uh, when you sequence microbiome, you take the sequences and you put them into different taxonomic units. Right. Because you can't actually isolate the bacteria, but you're you're looking at the sequence and you're assuming it's coming from you know Bacillus or uh, E. coli or whatever. Actually, the OTUs are even higher up. Yep. And they can, and essentially, they can say this fly has these OTUs. And this fly has those, and they can compare them. Now, this was, I thought, what they claim was a critical part of their paper, why their investigation was better than others, that mm. other people in the past have, have cultured out right. what would grow. Yeah, but that's a good that, point. That's only going to give you a tiny amount. Exactly. Tiny, wow. tiny. You can't, you can't you know, and, then, and then other yeah. people have taken the entire sand fly and just mashed it. And then that's right. And done a ribosomal screen and say, what, what bacteria... Um, are there in a whole smash sand fly? What they're saying is we specifically looked at this niche, this, must I say niche or niche? Niche, 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 niche. niche that's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they specifically looked at the niche where um, this parasite develops that's in right. the mid gut. And looking in the mid gut, they've used this highly sensitive ribosomal um, method of getting the whole diversity right. of um, microbes that are there. Yeah. And then they're using OTUs to make it somewhat understandable. Exactly. So what you find is that with uh, with sucrose, they have a certain number of OTUs. If you feed them blood, it goes down with days, and then it comes back up again. And then if you infect them, mm. the OTU number, just the, just the total number of OTUs, which in the sucrose is like almost 120 observed OTUs, it goes down, and as the parasites increase by, by day 9 and 12, it keeps going down. The microbiome decreases oh, as that. the parasites multiply. I guess it's not surprising, right? They're competing for things in the gut, they right? They are. And the other thing they might be competing for, although it's not clear by looking just at the data that they've expressed, is the actual attachment sites on the gut tract itself. Mm-hmm. But I wonder, you know, you, you mentioned the concept of they're competing for things. I don't think the number of microbes goes down. It's the diversity. The diversity is changing. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, that would be, that's another fact, interesting question is do you have less microbes? I don't know if you have less. I think you just have less diversity. I think you're diversity. right. You, you don't so have, read the sentence of figure one and it tells in very succinct language exactly what was going on. El Infantum parasite burden is inversely correlated bacterial with bacterial richness. richness. Yeah, that's the, rich, the phrase the we richness have to use. Is The richness. Right. The numbers are actually that's not changed. Right. Uh, it's the richness. So you have fewer OTUs, fewer different types of bacteria. Exactly. Uh, not numbers. But, you know, it could be that certain types of bacteria are outcompeted by the parasites, right? Yep. Whereas the sucrose, you give them a sucrose meal, it changes it, uh, but then it go- seems to rise back to normal. Exactly. It's very interesting. Exactly. So we should not drink sucrose. <laughs> changes our <laughs> gut. But we do all the time. <laughs> changes our gut microbiome. Yeah, well... Now, they can also look at the specific comp- composition at the um, ACA level. I was driving in the car with, a family, uh, sorry. with my daughter and one of her friends, and I was saying, you know, gosh, I just, you know, reading this new paper, and, like, everybody is really just focused on, you know, the microbiome, the microbiome of the gut, now the microbiome of sand flies. Sand flies. And my daughter and her friend said, no, Daddy. Not everybody. Not <laughs> everybody. Just you and the people you spend time with, <laughs> and the weirdos that you hang with. Uh, but good, it is. But it is interesting, right? Parties. Well, you know, the Times often writes about the microbiome. Yeah, there, no, I think it is more popular widely books because <laughs> because course. people are ascribing everything no, to the microbiome, health and watch, disease, right? Yes. No, yeah. you watch the transplants, obesity, diabetes, everything. You watch the evening news, and half of the ads are about. Problems of aging, like if your kidneys yeah, yeah. don't work well or you need uh, diapers and stuff. The microbiome comes up all the time in probiotics. They're always hammering away at this and claiming So, to, the Pseudomonad ACA, it's a family uh, level. It's a family. Okay? 
They yep. say they look at the different families over time. By day 12, Pseudomonad ACA comprised only 3% of the bio, uh-huh. compared to 36% in blood and fed sand flies. Conversely, 78% of the microbiome in infected sand flies at day 12 belong to Acetobacter ACA, compared to 33% in right. blood fed control. So they can look at specific families and see changes with changing the, the meal, either blood or infected blood that they give them. And so they, they drill into this. So this is okay, but we don't know what this means, of course, because we don't. all we know is that there's a change. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the the thing is, in the end, you have to be able to manipulate the gut microbiome to know mm-hmm. what, what good is it. And not just get rid of it. We'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. But get rid of it and put back specific components and ask, is this important for, for fly development, uh, for um, parasite development or another? Or where we'll ultimately go is, is knock some of it out. Knock some of it out right. and then put back yeah. components, right? right? But That's they don't right. do that in this paper. The next thing they do is say, we can we take them all out, but we don't put any back. They, t- right. they say, okay, among these bacteria uh, that are present under the different conditions, can we look at functional pathways that are in these particular bacteria, mm-hmm. okay? So there are databases where you can plug in, uh, you know, E. coli, and it'll tell you all the um, metabolic pathways that are there. So they can look at their their uh, characterized OTUs and, and ask what's, what's going on. So they say levels of pathways that allow microbes to acquire phosphate and iron via ATP binding uh-huh. cassette transport systems were significantly lower in the microbiota of uh, Lutzomia in, uh, leishmania infected sand flies than in blood fl- fed sand flies. So there's an in- apparent induction. So they're basically the changes in the bacteria are allowing greater expression of these phosphate and iron acquisition mechanisms. So maybe that's important for the parasite, right? Would that make sense? Uh, if we knew more about the metabolism of the parasite, yes. <laughs> we, we don't know a lot about it. Well, we've that's got the whole genome sequence, but we haven't put it all together yet. But this is all being grown in vitro, remember. So we, we know the components that are necessary for them to, to actually uh, complete their life cycle. So yeah. I think maybe these are important. No, but I think that was an excellent point, actually, Dixon, is that they talk about the phosphate, talk about the heme, they talk about these, um, they sort of, energy sources mm-hmm. but bringing it back to the energy sources of the parasite of the leishmania they, they you know i'll say they don't quite do that in this no. paper no um, it's observational yeah sure. so yeah. but that would be interesting for the future say so, you know let's connect so we've changed the microbiome we've done we've done this and that it's right. had this effect on the parasite but and here's some ideas they're sort of getting us to make the jump so, but let's okay. connect the dots you know, what you could do is reconstitute <laughs> flies with uh, bacteria that give you a specific metabolic product. Mm-hmm. So here they're saying phosphate and iron. So you could try phosphate alone or iron yeah. alone. Yeah. Or yeah. remove those specifically and see what happens. You have to be very granular about it. Yes. Which is hard. Yeah. Very hard. hard. Doing like, uh, yeah, sort of fecal, you, fecal transplants in the well, mid gut with, of sand you know, flies. This reminds me of the <laughs> old days that I spent at Notre Dame because uh, Notre Dame they were famous for their germ free research. And they, of course, they weren't doing germ free research on. Um, invertebrates they were doing them mostly on mammals mm. but some on birds too but here you you can take this concept right down to that level you can raise a germ-free sand fly and then you can add groups back at will yeah and well you that's when well, you're you going to get some really good answers the thing is you can't culture most of these bacteria so that's the problem right yeah that's true there are you know a thousand or fifteen hundred no, right. different you're right. kinds of bacteria in these flies probably and maybe fewer those are humans mammalian but maybe you don't need them all maybe you don't need them you know that's why some people work on insect guts where there are only two different bacteria in them interesting two so it makes it and you can culture both of them wow and that makes it much easier i'll be (laughs) at one or the other back yeah but these you know hundreds is is not a anyway the last experiment they do is they feed these flies uh an antibiotic cocktail that's good that's a good one. penicillin gentamicin and clindamycin so they say it depletes the native microbiome. Of course, it depletes it. doesn't eliminate it. It doesn't make them germ-free. Right. Although you could, you can culture them in some way, can raise them to be germ-free. Right. Are there germ-free sandfly colonies? Don't know. Hmm. Don't know. <laughs> Do not know. And they have a control group that are just given sucrose, and then they infect them 
and um, you know the antibiotics don't affect uh, the development to metacyclics in culture. Right. But basically, the replication is completely Im- impaired after one day only following antibiotic exactly. treatment. Exactly. Figure five B. Let's look at the curve. Let's go to the videotape. <laughs> I mean. It's just flat. <laughs> it's just flat. And I love the control here, too. The control is, since you can raise this uh, Leishmania in vitro, you can expose them to these same antibiotics. Yeah, and they so there's no effect whatsoever. They just grow fine, yeah. That that one on the left, the two curves are completely 100% yeah, superimposed. That's it's right. got to be faked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you gentlemen remember, but many years ago, there was a scientist at Cornell by the name of Ephraim Racker, and he had a graduate student called Mark Spector, and he worked on signal transduction in relation to uh, transformation of cells. And Racker used to give seminars, and he goes, this is the finest student I've ever had. All the points are on the line. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out that's because he faked them all. Yeah, that was my <laughs> hence, the oh, word, no. <laughs> hence the word Spector. <laughs> yeah, Spector, yes. In fact... Dear, dear, dear. Um, so that's why I'm just kidding, of course. But they are all on the line. They're pretty good. <laughs> no, I, th- no I thought this was. That. I thought this was key, right? Because I, you know, I I read the first. You know, the, the of course the figures right as you flip the page. So I read the first where they say, you know, we've we fed them an antibiotic cocktail, of penicillin, genomycin, clinda, and I'm thinking, hmm, let's see. You know, the the aminoglycoside, which is your genomycin and your clindamycin, are both going to mess with ribosomes. So the first thing I want to know is that they're not going to mess with the ribosomes of our parasite. Um, Because I felt pretty good. Penicillin, bacterial cell wall, it's good. So I flipped the page, and then, yeah, then we see this nice evidence. They're fine. The parasites are fine. But then when you put this into the system where it's messing with sand flies, then you see really dramatic differences. By the way, so uh, if you culture... The, the sand fly gut bacteria, um, they go from 2,772 colony-forming units to 10 colony-forming units after antibiotic treatment. So it's depressed substantially. You bet. It's funny they had to do statistics to show that changing from 10 to almost 3,000. <laughs> yeah, the p-value was 0. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I, I'm pretty much going to buy that 2,700. What, what I would have liked. So the conclusion, of course, is that you need the microbiome for this uh, yeah. morphological transformation right. of the parasite. It would have been nice if they gave him a fecal transplant and show it restored, right? That would have yeah. been but that's even hard. better. I wonder if you just left them alone with the normal sand flies, whether sure they, they would, would recover acquire. eventually. What's the lifespan of a sand fly? That's a great question. Maybe it's not too long. And I think it's less than two weeks, isn't that? I think well, if that's a mosquito. It varies, lifespan, it varies right, based on humidity and I stuff, really but I believe know. it's only a really matter of weeks. Know. So, by the way, they in this paper, they analyzed 2,091 mid-guts. Wow. <laughs> they dissected all those out to do this uh, sequencing. That's a lot of work. So, you need to have. So, so Daniel, should we just go out? And, and spray the world with antibiotics and get rid of every insect's microbiome, and that'll limit transmission of parasitic diseases? Uh, no, no. Okay. No. I'm going to I'm gonna say no. <laughs> it, it is interesting. You know, the, the couple of the things that I thought as I was reading this paper, and apparently thinking about microbiomes and the few of us that do, but I, I think we've established that it's more than just me and my few friends. So if my daughter's <laughs> listening to this, a lot of people care. Um was they fed them sucrose, right? And that mm-hmm. came up a little. Is that what sand flies usually consume, right? Fructose. What is their sugar source? Probably so, fructose. Yeah, that was the thing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't fructose, which I would have thought was their major. Right. And we've we've yeah. read papers before where um, sometimes insects will feed on fruits, right? Papayas, mangoes, right. Um, fructose um, mm-hmm. from it's- from flowering plants, right? So there's different sources. And we've seen that that actually has an impact. Exactly. And so yeah, are there ways yeah. to, you know, maybe plant certain things where you're going to manipulate their microbiome in such a way, yeah, that's a good you point. know, healthy eating, yeah. not yeah. antibiotics, yeah. Sure. to maybe decrease the uh, susceptibility yeah, right. of the sand fly yeah. to yeah. this yeah. infective development? Correct. They also make the interesting point that um, they should do this study um, with wild-caught sand flies to make sure that the uh, results would be the same. You know? right. I mean, if you That's take wild sand flies, maybe there's less of an effect or no effect. Who knows? So it's exactly. interesting. I'm sure they'll do well, this that This is next. a wonderful foundation for a bright future to look at uh, yep. the interplay between um, 
various degrees of nature. <laughs> I thought it was fascinating. I mean, the whole idea that you could potentially manipulate the gut micro, the mid gut microbiome of a sand fly and have an impact right. on, you know, this is a great approach to vector control. Yeah, that's right. You know, let's just make them healthy, whatever. <laughs> it also means uh, that the devil is in the details. There's no question about that. I mean, you know, these are so innocent looking little bugs that they can barely fly for gosh sake. Well, that's, that's actually a great point is the sand fly does not have a huge range. Like it's about, I think we said two weeks for lifespan. It's about two feet for like exactly. their, I mean, they don't really like to go very far from the world their of the sand source. fly is very limited. So you can, in your home environment, potentially yeah. change mm. the, um, the diet of your sand flies, right? <laughs> yeah. By planting, by planting different plants, different fruit, different, oh, you know, because they also like uh, some stuff where they, they like getting their fructose from the flowers of coffee plants, right? Yeah. You know, so if you have coffee yeah. plants or you That's have, right. you know, maybe, you know, future stuff, instead of antibiotics, you change the microbiome with different plants. Sure. And now you say, Hey, you guys, you don't have to spray. You just have to plant these trees in your yard. Plant marigolds, right? Right, right, exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm. And Devil's Nightshade. <laughs> you know what that's from? What's in Devil's Nightshade? Belladonna. Belladonna, yeah. Do you, why, do you know why they call it Belladonna? Nope. Because in the old days, um, <laughs> in Italy, the old days. when the, uh, the ladies uh, wanted to attract a male suitor, Mm -hmm. They would put drops of belladonna in their eyes, and it permanently dilates the pupils and makes them wider. Now, why would you need to do that? And so a study at the University of Chicago much later in mm -hmm. the years determined that when you're really interested in something, your pupils dilate. And people recognize mm -hmm. that. And when they look at you, they think you're interested in them. Look at you. So belladonna has its origins in that Interesting. Um, Milieu, it? No, it's interesting. I've done studies where you, when you're having a conversation, you actually, whether you realize it or not, you're judging the size of the person's pupils. Really? Correct. And if they're really big, you think they're interested and excited that's, that's and you just keep right. talking. Yeah. And if you can get them to constrict down, people will often stop mid-sentence. And so I've I've actually mm. worked on the ability to constrict my pupils. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Most of the people I talk to, their eyes are closed, so I can't. Uh, that's right. That's I can't right. even tell if their pupils are that's big. Dan, Daniel, do you have any other cases for us? Oh my uh, I'm, I'm out. That's, yeah. that's it. No, no, I have a case. Of course, I have a case. This is going to be the last of our our trio of ones you guys are helping me with for the P score. Uh. And this is our eosinophilia case, right? Ah. Uh. So we're, we're now going to work up a patient with eosinophilia. Wonderful. This is a 29-year-old Peace Corps volunteer working in Rwanda. Mm, uh, right. Presenting with three weeks of feeling poorly. What's the, what's the gender here? I believe it's a woman. Three yes. weeks. Yeah, three weeks. It's feeling a woman. poorly. Feeling poorly. Okay. Is this a woman? <laughs> <laughs> Check the chromosomes. <laughs> Actually, you know what? It has to be a guy, just because I, when we get to the next part of the case. Okay. Um, but it doesn't matter. This particular case doesn't matter whether they're male or female, I'll say. Except you'll get to the part where you're like, yeah, that was a guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the story is it starts with this um, rash, mm -hmm. which is on the lower back and upper legs. Okay. Um, and it's a, a macular papular, so it's lots of sort of little, small, red areas um, from really small to a little bit larger um, and a little bit raised in areas. Um, then there's fatigue, so later on, and then a cough later develops, then diarrhea, and the patient has 51% uh, eosinophils, mm -hmm. so an absolute eosinophil count of 9,000. So we wow. figured their white counts up about 18,000, quite elevated. Wow. Half of those are eosinophils. That's remarkable. Okay. Patient has no significant exposure to fresh water. Um, and I mentioned this person's in, <laughs> person is in Rwanda, right? So this is like really central. Yeah. You know. Land of the gorillas. So it is land of girls. So that's one of my first sort of questions when I hear about this is like, so right. wait, what kind of Rwanda? Is this someone who's out in the bush where there's a lot of- Diane um, Fossey. Yeah, you know, where there's a lot of gorillas? Or is this someone who's like in a, in a, in a rural village? Like what kind of- Yeah, yeah. Um, so they, they get this call, right? I'm not going to give you guys as much maybe as you like. They get the call. Here's the story. Um, stool, they send off for ova parasites. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I asked a few more questions. I was like, you know, the characteristic rash. Well, right. when the person is like, well, you know, there was this embarrassing thing where I, I sat down in an area and I got something on my sort of behind area here, like where the rash later developed. Mm -hmm. And I realized it was feces. And my next right. question was, what kind of feces? Indeed. <laughs> was this like, you know, human feces, yeah. dog feces, yeah. primate? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, said, yeah, yeah. they were they're quite upset. They did wash it off. As you <laughs> wait a minute. Imagine. Wait, can I ask you, did this person have a pants on? So that's the interesting thing. They had shorts on uh -huh. and there is a certain sparing, right? The rash is lower back and upper legs. I so see. where they actually <laughs> had the pants on, they did not seem to have the rash. The upper, right. I don't get the upper back because if they sit down. Well, they sat down in it, I guess, was the. Unless it's on on a chair and it's smeared on the back. In the, oh, uh, you, you, know, you think it wasn't a chair, right? So they're, they're sitting down on the ground, ground leaning yeah, back, yeah. and right. they realize, hey. I'm Did they know what kind of feces it was? So that was my big question. I was like, what kind of, no. no. They were just happy to get it washed off. And and, uh, yeah. and, and this was actually later because I when I heard the story, I was like, so I got a question. It might seem odd. Did you? any contact with this area maybe in something? And then they brought up, well, this is embarrassing. And then here, this is the final thing you get. And this, this should help you. <laughs> they send off the oven parasites and they are, they are called back saying that they are seeing larva in the stool. Uh-huh. Mm. Okay. Uh-huh. Mm. That's it. That's, that's all it. you get. That's all we get. That's, that's all you get. That's plenty. <laughs> it's plenty. You got it already? Uh, I'm afraid uh, so. I'm afraid so. You're afraid so. So this is a male, three weeks of feeling poorly, uh, no medical issues, right? Not HIV negative. Mm -hmm. No medical issues, no surgeries. This is straightforward. This is a real direct case history. Uh, he doesn't drink kava. <laughs> we don't have any kava reports. No kava. <laughs> and... Um, Stool, larva and stool. No, they're seeing larva. Larva and stool. D Dixon, do you want to know how big the larva are? No, I already know. You already know? Yep. I'm just thinking if I have anything else to ask. He you. said overconfidently. <laughs> All right. I think Dixon will get this one. I think I might. I think this might be a, a and, classic. And this is an otherwise healthy 29-year-old, uh, right? Yeah. Okay, and, I, I, yeah. and I'm going to say, I, th I think this hopefully will get a, a lot of responses because I think this one is, is reasonably straightforward. Good. Um, it is, I would The say. next one, though, I'm going to give you guys be tougher. is going to be so tough that no one will know the answer. <laughs> well, we have to rally our troops here. <laughs> our troops have disappeared, and unless they come back, we're not going to have a nice little oh, discussion. Oh, we'll, they'll come back for this one. They will come back for this one. No right. one will be shy about submitting a response to this one i don't think you don't think so i don't Dixon? think so i think they'll all come forth all right we'll have lots of reads all right we have two emails to read we dixon do. can you take uh one from dan <laughs> i guess i will uh dan writes dear twipanosomes after dixon's comments on twip 126 i'm looking forward to hearing his take on the parasitology superhero sir ronald ross Many years ago, I studied at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, where Ross was celebrated as their first professor of tropical medicine, the first British Nobel laureate, and a talented polymath, meaning he was very good at mathematics. When the University of Liverpool opened an institution, an institute of infection and global health in 2010, they named the building after him. It was only after reading Spielman and D'Antonio's book, Mosquito, the story of man's deadliest foe, and hearing Robert Quads on Twib number 28, that I realized that this fascinating character had more of a mixed reputation globally. Best regards, Dan. And in fact, uh, he does have a mixed reputation. Um, and it begins with his um, entree into medicine. In fact, as a young student, he actually didn't want to go to medical school, but his uh, parents demanded that he do that. And I'm not sure if anybody out there has had children or was a child. <laughs> I know I sure, sure were, was. And I can remember how I felt when I was ordered to do anything that my parents wanted me to do that I didn't want to do. And so Ross reluctantly went to uh, medical school. And when I say reluctant, I mean very reluctant. In fact, he was such a poor medical student that uh, there was a, a an exam that everyone must pass in order to go on to the third and fourth years, and he failed it. Mm. 
<laughs> he had to take it again. Not because he was stupid <clears throat> by any means. He was extremely bright, and he uh, wrote poetry, and he he starred in plays. I, I believe that, uh, Vincent, you have a son that enjoys uh, thespianing activities recently. He was in a Shakespearean play. He was. And, and your proud chest burst, burst open when I asked him how he was doing, and you said he's doing My great. Chest burst open, and out came a parasite. <laughs> <laughs> That's just right. like that. Movie. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Alien. 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 <laughs> so, so Ross muddled through medical school, and because he finished in the second half of his class, he wanted to go into the British medical service in India. And in fact, he was allowed to do so, but he wasn't allowed to go to India. <laughs> he was subjected to an island off the coast of India to begin with in some small, <laughs> out-of-the-way place to get rid of him because they realized that he wasn't very interested in anything. Meanwhile, he made contact with Patrick Manson, of all people. And Patrick Manson, uh, a giant in the field of parasitic diseases, in fact, Chistosoma mansoni is named after him and lots of other parasites as well and worked on life cycles got in touch with um, with Ross and said, look, here, young man, if you want to go any place in this world, you're going to have to listen up and you're going to have to get smart. And Ross eventually, I guess you would say he found religion. He had an epiphany and he started to put his nose to the grindstone. But um, at the suggestion of Patrick Manson, uh, he was told basically, you know, if you want to make your reputation – you should look at malaria and try to find out what transmits the damn thing because it's been around for millions of years and we still don't know anything about it. So Ross began reluctantly again because someone else was telling him what to do. He set up a colony of birds because everyone knew that birds had malaria and uh, he began looking at the possibility of, of a vector that might transmit uh, the parasite to the birds and eventually struggling in his laboratory because it was not well um, appointed. He was working in someone else's lab, as a matter of fact, determined once and for all that mosquitoes were the vectors for malaria. And in this case, it was the Culex mosquito that was transmitting malaria from bird to bird. And Ross was uh, uh, celebrated for for that finding because he was actually the first person to ever demonstrate this at at the prodding of, of course. Was that in Canaries? Yeah, it was in canaries and other wild birds, too. He worked on some crows and, and that sort of thing. And he found it, and it was true for all of the birds that he looked at. Then he returned to England <clears throat> pardon me, and developed a reputation uh, th- around that finding, which allowed him to become the senior editor for the British Medical Journal. And in addition to that, of course, he established a practice in London and uh, began his winding his way towards what would become the England's first Nobel Prize winner. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he was he was nominated by several people, and I, I believe that uh, Patrick Manson was one of those people. And um, mm-hmm. the story goes that when he received the Nobel Prize, you usually thank the people that got you there. And uh, Ronald Ross didn't do that. He <laughs> didn't have a single good word to say about anybody else except himself. And that's, I think, where Robert Guads, who's a good friend of mine, uh, he knows a lot more about these stories than I do, um, and was a good friend of Andy Spielman, by the way, who wrote that book on mosquitoes, um, started to raise a red flag and saying, you guys are over-celebrating this person. He's really not as great as you make him out to be, because look what happened next. Grazzi and several other big nami and uh, a few other colleagues in Italy found what the true vector for human malaria was, and in this case, it was Anopheles mosquitoes, not Culex. Now you say to yourself, well, then why didn't at least um, Grazi get the Nobel Prize along with Ross? And the answer was very clear. Uh, one of the nominators for the Nobel Prize was none other than Robert Koch. And Robert <laughs> Koch actually had the distinction of trying to do laboratory work, and it turns out that he wasn't very good with his hands. And he, they didn't find that out until he wanted to go and work in Grassi's laboratory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Grassi was a stickler for detail. <laughs> and he said, you don't even know how to use a microscope. What's wrong with you? He said that to, to Koch. Mm. Koch went back to Germany and said, that man will never, never, ever win the Nobel Prize if, <laughs> over my dead body. And <laughs> he ended that's up supporting funny. Ross's nomination instead. And that's, yeah. that's part mythology, but part true as well. <clears throat> I don't blame... 
the British community of tropical medicine people for celebrating Ronald Ross's accomplishments because, you know, he ended up working night and day on these things and uh, devoted the rest of his adult life to them. But he was known as an arrogant son of a bitch, but to be honest with you, if you wanted to put it in plain language. So we have children. We have children. <laughs> well, a son of a bitch is a, a dog, <laughs> a female dog that gave birth to him. All right, all right. Dixon, <clears throat> this is, you just yeah. did a superhero. Yeah, I did. Did you do it off the cuff? I did that off the cuff. Yes, I did. You, I, I'm pr- pretty well familiar with this pr- story. Pretty familiar with Ronald Ross. I am, and Bob and I've had uh, Robert Gwads and I've had several conversations about this. So I'm I'm convinced that this this is the truth. And if you go to Wikipedia, by the mm-hmm. way, the Wikipedia section on Ronald Ross has been revised several times over the last five years to reflect all of these changes in our attitudes towards him, and. Um, he still lives on in, in my mind as one of the superheroes in parasitology because he was the first one to show that mosquitoes transmit mm-hmm. malaria. By the way, where did he get the idea to look at mosquitoes? Where? He got them from two other people. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even get them from Sir Patrick Manson, who went on to become knighted, of course. He got them from Theobald Smith and mm-hmm. a colleague who determined that that infectious diseases could be transmitted by arthropod vectors, and they worked on ticks Mm. and uh, babesia. That result came out first, and then Patrick Manson said, look, if ticks can transmit this to cattle, I'll bet you. And he was insightful. He said, why don't you work on the the, uh, things that end up feeding on birds and seeing whether or not you can prove that one of those is the vector for malaria. And, And, you know, he more or less took his nose and led him right to the result. <laughs> so Patrick Manson probably should have received the Nobel Prize just for the idea of looking. Yes, well, these things are never always fair. Not, not always fair. They're not always fair. It's In fact, prizes are a big problem. I well, think. that's exactly right. Uh, Caleb writes, uh, greetings. I was going to say one yes, thing. Sir. I just, because in case our listeners um, didn't catch that Dixon was joking about the polymath he was excellent in math, but a polymath is this odd expression for people that are just broadly knowledgeable. Mm. Well, uh, he was, but he was uh, apparently also <laughs> an excellent mathematician and did a lot of these great yeah. sort of modeling right. for epidemics, uh, and which are still being used today, by the way. Mm-hmm. So part of his contribution still lives on. Yep. All right, uh, Caleb writes, "Greetings, doctors. I, as always, I would like to thank you for your wonderful array of podcasts. I look forward every week." to listening to new and informative content. I have two reasons behind my email today. First, I am currently TA of our medical and veterinary entomology course taught to undergraduates here at the University of California, Riverside, and I have been given the privilege of giving two guest lectures to the undergraduate students. I wanted to thank you for the easy access to the PDF of the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases, which gave me a great starting point in developing my lectures on Chagas disease. I've made sure in my lecture to include a link to Parasites Without Borders so nice. any of my students could access your book at will. Terrific. Or against their will. <laughs> they like it or not. Second, right. I heard on the latest TWIV that your entomology contact backed out of producing a podcast on insects. I have a friend and collaborator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln who's an extension entomologist who already has an entomology podcast called Arthropod. That's funny. (laughs) That's great. I like that. You might want to get in touch with him about collaborating on a new entomology podcast. It's arthro-pod.blogspot.com. No need. He's got a podcast. That's all there is to it. No need to make another one. Exactly. Caleb is a PhD student at UC Riverside. Yeah. And finally, we have an email from... Anthony, who writes, Raccoon roundworms, a threat to people and many animals. He sends a link to an article in Outbreak News Today. Bailis Ascaris. Bailis Ascaris. How do you say it? Bailis Ascaris. Bailis Ascaris. Everything you wanted to know is found in USGS monograph. Oh, right. They have a the U.S. Geological Survey, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a common raccoon roundworm. That's hmm? right. Co- recognized cause of clinical larva migraines in animals. Exactly. <laughs> and not that you'd ever see it because they have fur. How would you see the larva migraine? Maybe on their feet where there's no... Oh, it's visceral larva migraine. So this is not cutaneous. This is visceral. So it drives them crazy, basically. They they exhibit mm-hmm. aberrant behavior. No, it's not the one under your skin. No. Or neural larva migraine. That's oh. right. Uh, this is definitely the cause of that. 
Yeah, unfortunately. This the, is very the, serious. And one of the problems with mm. this um, worm is that when it does get into the brain, yeah. it continues to enlarge in size. It doesn't stop. Um, like your dog worm, for instance, might will get size, it stops. This And as it grows, and these will get into human beings as well. Exactly. Um, uh, it can really be a horrible uh, situation. Well, they've had some deaths yeah. in children from this. Or, in the New York area, actually. Um, there was a few cases. Well, maybe we'll actually yeah. talk about them. We I'm familiar it, with the doctor that It's an extremely difficult diagnosis to make because the larvae don't come out in the stool or blood or anything. They're in the deep tissues, and it's mm-hmm. very rare that you would actually... It's often actually... an autopsy diagnosis. So they say because of the ubiquity of infected raccoons around humans, there's considerable human exposure. Right. So for those of you mm-hmm. who have the sixth edition of our mm-hmm. book from a PDF version, I can recommend which figure shows you that. And I'll turn to that right now. It's under the aberrant nematodes yeah, yeah the the unfortunate thing is these raccoons make these like latrines they actually have a place where they'll go to the bathroom repeatedly mm-hmm. and then this area can become a source and sometimes these now that they're sort of peri domestic animals it'll often be close to someone's upstate cabin or something and then the children they go out they're playing you know and hands are touching things yeah. and yeah yeah um, yeah well interestingly this is an, now a monograph uh, put out by the USGS. It's 122 pages written by Dr. Kevin Kazakos, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Parasitology at Purdue University. Right. Uh, and um, it um, tells you all about it. Yep. The diagram I'm talking about is a figure 27.7. 27.7. On page 319. 319. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. This report, by the way, is the eighth in the series of the yeah. U.S. Geological Survey circulars on zoonotic diseases. How about that? Thank you for pointing that out, Anthony. And you can find all the episodes of TWIP at iTunes or microbe.tv slash TWIP, or if you're using a, a phone, a smartphone, or a tablet, you know, there are apps that you can use to listen to podcasts. Just subscribe. You get them all free. If you want to help us out, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have many ways you can help us. A Patreon account, Amazon affiliate links, Cash, credit cards, gold. I was going to say gold. I was going to say gold. <laughs> Help us out. That's right. So we can travel. And you can send your questions and comments. Case guesses to TWIP at microbe.tv. Now, I have a book for you right uh-huh. here. It's very heavy. You know, the, the way you rate a book is by weight. Oh, this is at least eight pounds. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is the sixth edition of Diagnostic Medical Parasitology, right. published by ASM press no it's quite a good book i actually enjoyed watching and looking through the book it has wonderful illustrations it's edited by lynn shore garcia from uh, california yep from a a laboratory there it looks like she's a wonderful uh, wonderful uh, got the whole thing diagnostic procedures of all sorts let's see what else clinically important human parasites wow it's got lists and lists and lists i guess i should keep this but it's a nice adjunct (laughs) to our own book. immunology Medically important arthropods. What the hell with it. I'm not giving this away. <laughs> if you'd like to win this, be the 14th emailer. You have 14. to do the following. Listen carefully, please. You send an email to twip at microbe.tv with the subject line, I love twip. All right, some people in other contests, they don't do that. You have to put it in there. You have to in the subject the line. I love twip. Now you have it with a small i. Should they capitalize the i or should yeah, it? It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter as long as it says that. And Daniel, you could participate, but you know the fourteenth email. <laughs> it's not easy to nail. Why does? Why am I picking fourteen, Dixon? Let's see, because today is Valentine's Day. Yeah, it's that's February fourteenth. Right. February fourteenth. In fact, Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Exactly. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Medical Center, ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. Good to see you again. Yeah, Now and pleasure. then you're going to be in vivo? Um, every couple weeks or so, I'm going to be back here at Columbia. Good. Seeing the fellows back in the lab. Um, you Excellent. Know, even more often, maybe. Dixon de Pommiers at Trichinella.org, TheLivingRiver.org, ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Dixon. Uh, what an enjoyable afternoon this was, to have all three of us together again. Are you That's sarcastic? Nice. No, 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 no. Being, do I sound sarcastic? Yeah, you do. No, I don't. No, no. I meant that from the bottom of my heart. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this episode, Blue Apron. 
You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is is parasitic. parasitic.